Sometimes simple changes can open a whole new world in our sewing. I remember the first time I saw sewing machine needles that were shaped differently from the ones I had always used. And the difference they made in my sewing was amazing. Today, we're going to learn where small changes can take us in our sewing. Using special needles, sewing old techniques in a new way, and turning a garment accessory into something unexpected. I think it's time for us to begin our journey and see where these changes take us. I am so happy you have come to my sewing room today. Welcome to my sewing room. Simply fabulous is this camisole with this matching pants. I cannot wait for you to see the wonderful machine and a little bit of hand technique. Uh, this is a beautiful wing needlework that has been stitched onto fabric, cut out, and then finished off with a little bit of handwork and embroidery floss. The same technique, well not the same, another stitch, but the same machine work with a little bit of handwork is around the top of the bodice. Don't you love this motif, the machine embroidered motif? And on the top of this camisole, so cotton netting has been placed on top of the fabric so when you do the machine embroidery you cut away the cotton from behind it it's a little bit peekaboo the peekaboo effect is also down here with beautiful machine insertion and then the cotton netting machine insertion and then the bottom is simply simply plain now let me just show you the pants oh so pretty the same decorative beautiful insertion is around the legs of the pants. this is so good looking i love it and then a beautiful machine embroidery is below the insertion to actually hem the tap pants let's see how this is done and the beautiful thing is of course it's easy now, first of all, you're going to make your strip. You know, the straps that I showed you, you're going to make the strip by doing your machine sewing and then trim away the fabric very carefully from both sides of the strip. After that, you're going to use a tapestry needle, a very blunt tapestry needle, and some embroidery floss and do a little bit of handwork, namely a blanket stitch. We're going to show you that in just a minute, too. This is what it looks like when it's finished with the machine work and the tapestry work. Of course, we're going to use embroidery floss for that. And then the same sort of technique is used. This time, it is the netting, which is on top of the fabric, the stitching, and then the embroidery floss. I'm so happy to have as my guest today, my very dear friend, Sue Hausman. Sue is the host of America Sews, a wonderful PBS show. And Sue, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. <laughs> it's so great to be here. And I have to share that this is a wonderful project done oh, by Patty Jo Larson. And by Patty Jo. I have the, the privilege of sharing it with all of you, which is so fun. But if you notice, Martha, you mentioned machine insertion. This is actually done in the hoop. Oh. So it's done with the embroidery machine. And you can see here a number of different insertions on this endless embroidery collection. And I can tell you it's multi-format, fits all sewing machines. So that's, a well, embroidery machines, but lots of different things. And you can see that in the hoop, the stitching is done. And then the machine stops for you to trim away the fabric. And then the final stitching is done after that. So it's all done there, as was that beautiful motif on the front that you mentioned, uh, the fact that that too, once it's stitched, trim out from behind. This is really tricky. Trim carefully so as not to <laughs> cut through the cotton netting on the top. But that is the layer that makes it so beautiful, that cotton netting layer on top and the little insertion piece into the camisole. But what we're going to focus on today is how to do the straps. Because so often people say to me, you know, I don't like turning those little tiny tubes. And they're just plain old straps and we could use ribbon. Wait till you see this fun technique because it's so easy to do the straps this way. We're actually using, as Martha said, a wing needle and it's hem stitching. Now, a couple of tricks for wing needle. You know, the first time I saw this, I looked at this needle and I went, this is 
going to poke a really big hole in the fabric. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to. <laughs> and the, the wing needles come in two different sizes, uh, 100 over 16. And you'll notice when you look for them in the store, they say wing. This 130 by 705H means it'll fit in your machine. And then here, the 120 by 19. We use the 120 by 19 to make big holes. Compare that to a regular needle. Look at the difference in the size of those. A lot of people use a uh, applique type B foot, a foot with the tunnel underneath for this, either the transparent or the plain. Most of the time, I like to use a regular foot with the flat underside because it applies more pressure to the fabric and doesn't allow any, any puckering or lifting. And so you'll always want to sew a sample to see how it looks, but know that on the lengthwise grain, you will get more distortion of the fabric than on the crosswise or the bias. So keep that in mind too, as you're sewing your garment and always do a test sample. Find thread top and matching in the bobbin because you don't want that thread to fill the holes of what you're doing. Now let's pick up this piece of fabric and take it over to the sewing machine. A lot of people would use stabilizer for this. Um, when you are working in this case with a double layer to make it a little bit stronger for the strap of this Batiste, you will see that you don't need stabilizer underneath. If you get any distortion, again, crosswise green would give you the best result. You see a little bit there, but we're gonna be able to just pull that right out and press it right out. But if you did, you could starch the fabric, right, Martha? Starch it. Starch yeah. it away. And so you can see now that what we have is our wonderful stitching. And if we go back to the boards, you'll notice that on the boards, there's a whole piece done. Because obviously for a strap, you want to do a piece long enough to be the strap. Now we need two straps, so we're going to do one long row of this hem stitch. Look on your machine. Many people think that only the entredeau stitch is the hem stitch they have on their machine. Uh, you probably have 10, 15 different stitches that work wonderfully with the wing needle. If they go back and forth into the same hole, they'll work wonderfully with the wing needle. Then you simply pick up and with a very sharp scissors, we say cut through the holes on the edge. And so just cut this out through the holes on the edge and you'll ultimately have a very strong strap, just like that. And what you can do then to make it even more beautiful is use like a tapestry needle or a small bodkin, something with a blunt end rather than a sharp end. And you know, you can then push it through that hole, come up and create that little bit of a blanket stitch on the edge. And you'll see here how the blanket stitch was done all along the edge of that. Think about the effects you could get with different colors of threads and with different color threads of embroidery floss to do that with. And of course, as Martha showed you, that's possible along the edge of this as well. And real quickly, notice too that you can use some of these guide feet and always check the underside. The underside of the foot is more important than the top side because the flatter ones will will create less uh, shifting of the fabric, but the ones with the tunnel, which are the clear ones in this case, will allow for more buildup of stitches underneath. Well, this is just so exciting. What do you think, Martha? I think it is beautiful. Good. Thank you so You're much. You're so welcome. And now Sue has some sewing inspirations to share with you. Sue, I can't wait for our viewers to see what this is. It's so cute. It's, it's actually a, a cover purse. for your bag and you make it the size for your favorite purse oh. and then you can change it of course because it just lifts right off but it has Turn. the embroideries. You want to see the, it on both on sides. The both sides. And the hot fix crystals. It's and the look at the cute little rickrack. Isn't that fun? Oh it's yeah. so much fun. So, you want to put that over there? Yep. This beautiful Christine dress. Alex Graham Michelle made this and she made it on an entry level look, look sewing at this. machine. Okay. You know, people but, think you have to have the top of the line to be able okay. to do it. But you don't. Beautiful, beautiful stitches. And then let's talk about these beautiful stitches down here, yep. which are not top of the line machine no. stitches. It's the twin needle pin tucks and decorative stitches done tone on tone and the insertion with the beautiful entredeau wing needle stitch. So, And also on linen, handkerchief yep. linen. You know, so a lot of times we love to do handkerchief linen for mm -hmm. boy Christmas dresses or girls either one. Now this is a favorite. Oh, so purchased, much fun. Purchased jacket. Okay. Purchased at an outlet okay. store. Okay. Um, actually a maternity jacket, but I don't tell most people that. <laughs> now I've told the world. And the darling little Victorian <laughs> houses, which give a very vertical line to a body like mine that isn't too vertical. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love this is so yeah, cute. We're having so mm -hmm. much fun. And notice the little, you know, like the little uh, different uh, 
the the um, the little window, window curtains, with curtains are all loose, so they, they they float in the breeze. Oh, so <laughs> adorable. Yeah. This Good is a Richelieu. Looking. Good looking. This is actually a Richelieu design. Again, a ready-made jacket. Uh, However, it's intended to be cut, but on this jacket, I wouldn't want to cut away the wool, and so I backed it with a black fabric so that the Richelieu cutaway effect is given visually without the holes. Oh, this is, is absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Now, yeah. oh, you know I love <laughs> the heirloom quilt. Tell me your thinking on this, Sue. Well, I'd love to come back and teach this to your viewers because it is an heirloom technique quilt but done in quilters cotton fabrics wonderful and you can see the puffing technique and the insertion technique the wing needle techniques okay the french lace mm -hmm. the insertion done in the non-traditional heirloom colors yes and of course pin twin needle tucks and then we have some stippling and one of the wonderful little ruffle on the edge is done so easily with the ruffler attachment this so, is absolutely yeah. wonderful and as you said here's the wing needle work such as uh, as on that cute little camisole that patty mm -hmm. joe did i think that looks mm -hmm. like the same maybe the same stitch. matter of fact i believe that's oh, a lot of the same stitches totally different look with heirloom t uh, heirloom stitches and techniques yes totally uh, different look when it's done in those quilters cottons so much fun yeah. and so has something else for you a so quick so easy idea So we're having so much fun embroidering on these beautiful pashminas, and I can't wait for you to tell our audience the story. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was at Marth Pullen School in Kathy McMakin's class, and she pulled one of these out, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I've got an idea, and ran to the sewing machine to make it into a poncho. So that's what I'm going to share with you today, because often these big stole things are just way too big for me. They don't stay on, they slop around. I like to make them into a little poncho that I can just pull over my head and wear and then it looks a little better than having to wrap it around me or something. Now you start with one of these purchased uh, pashmina type yeah. type stoles and they, the thing I want to point out is that they come in all different colors and they come in all different sizes and they come in all different qualities and they come in all different costs. These uh, <laughs> range in cost from about $10 all the way up to I think about $50 for the all silk one. Interesting thing about the all silk one, it would not not be big enough to make the poncho and I didn't realize that Martha that it's okay. so narrow it's just a very very narrow about 24 inches so take it out of the package and measure it or get a feel for it on your body before you buy it because you want one that's at least about 30 inches uh, wide and probably 68 to 72 inches long something a, a really generous size one now the other thing is depending on the quality some of them embroider beautifully and some of them you have to be really careful of Martha because uh, the needle makes marks the hoop makes marks because the the fact that they're such a kind of loosely woven often rayon they say they're cashmere I'm not sure that you can always believe what they say they are, but these particular ones, I know some of them are very nice quality, so you just get different kinds. But where I'm going to do the embroidery, put a piece of fusible, kind of soft sheer type stabilizer on the back, and that'll stabilize that embroidery. And you, you go, well, how do I know where to put the embroidery? Good question. First thing you do is sew it into the poncho, try it on, stand in front of a mirror, and mark where the embroidery goes. Otherwise, you could have an embroidery in a very strange place. And keep it up <laughs> toward your face. Don't put embroideries down here where you don't want people looking. Okay, so once, you on your stomach, you would once not you've want done that, the other thing, because of the fact that this <laughs> is such a loosely woven fabric, uh, choose a design that's not a real heavy design, okay. and also enlarge it. Most machines, you can scale right in the machine. But you know, you can print out the design and see and scale it up and make it bigger and then it won't be quite as dense a stitching. So use the scaling function on your machine to make the design bigger. Hoop stabilizer only. Lay the scarf onto the hoop and fix baste it in place rather than hooping because this will leave hoop marks. For some reason, it stretches the fibers. And then do your embroidery. Once that's done, all you do to sew this together is to simply take and fold it crosswise, which is really the way it's folded in the package. So the fringes are matching down there. Okay, see the fringes matching down there, Martha? I do. And then from the fold, measure 18 inches. And I can do that right here on the front of the machine. So this is 18 inches, so it's really 36 from inches. From the fold. From the fold, it's really 36 inches, because it's double. And then you're going to just mark that, start sewing at the fringe, because then you know it's gonna match. And then just straight stitch along the edge of that 
that and what you will create and I've actually already created this one so that you'll be able to see Martha but what you will create once you've done that backstitch well here at the end because okay. but you see by starting at the fringe you always will come out even okay <laughs> with okay. the fringe okay. and here and then this just goes like so over your head the S in this case will fall, here's my head coming through here, will fall right in the front, and the rest of it will fall into a really fun little poncho Pashima. What do you think? I think it's beautiful, and I think it's fun to wear, it's easy to wear, and a wonderful way of putting machine embroidery on something that we enjoy. I think it's also very flattering, you know, loose yes. and flattering. Yes. And just something wonderful that is totally in the stores today. You go in and you see pashmina this and pashmina that. So I'm excited about it <laughs> and all the different colors. Thank you so much, Sue. You're so welcome. <laughs> and next we have some machine embroidery ideas for you. I'm so happy to have as my guest today, Denise Applegate. Denise is sales and creative manager of embroidery designs for Cactus Punch. Denise, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Martha. I'm so excited. We have the funnest, cutest little project. It's a little sachet. And so we're going to need some bobbins, embroidery thread, and some batiste. And this is the little sachet. I'll let you hold that. Okay, I'll hold it. And some glue. And then once you have those items, we're going to need an embroidery collection. And so this collection is actually cookie cutter designs for Christmas tree ornaments. And then we'll need whatever scent your favorite scent is for the sachet. Now, what I have here is you have two parts. The first part is going to draw an outline of the cookie cutter or our sachet. And the second one is going to do the top piece. And we're going to sandwich those together in just a few minutes. Now I have a larger hoop option too, so I've put two in a larger hoop to show that you could do two at the same time, which makes it really nice and easy. And then there's the second step of that. And then underneath here, this particular one, I've taken that glue stick and glued down the sachet scent. So whatever it is you choose to put in your potpourri or whatever, we're going to glue that down. And then the final step is our sandwich of the two together. So let's go to our sewing machine and I'll show you how that works. On here, I've got a layer underneath, which is our first layer, our tearaway stabilizer, and our top layer. And in between there, we've done the sachet, and now we're going to sew the two together. All right, okay. So as that goes around, this is actually the first step of the embroidery that we've backed up and we're now doing for the final step to do the outline of the, the little bird. And everything is already in there, sachet, mm -hmm. yep. uh, the bottom step, the sachet, the top step, and that's your outline stitch that was your first stitch actually, right. the first time you went around to get the shape. Right, we just backed up our colors on our sewing machine and went back to that first color and now it's just doing the outline. To join the whole thing and then when it finishes you're going to take it out and just trim it closely to the line. Trim it close to the line. You want to put this one back over there and show our viewers one more time what that looks like. Absolutely precious idea. You know, I was thinking when you showed me these, I thought, wow, wouldn't that be wonderful teacher presents, uh, Sunday school teacher presents, yes. just special friend presents, yes. uh, whatever, you know, your Bible study group, whatever little, whatever groups you have, what a special touch that would be for a different kind, or Mother's Day, or birthday, or whatever. I love this project, Denise. So much fun with our sewing, with our embroidery machines. Thanks for having me, Martha. Thank you so much. And next, I have some quilting ideas to share with you. One of my all-time favorite heirloom techniques is a lace-shaped diamond, and I have a really special square on the quilt to share with you today and some fun techniques. All right, this is the lace-shaped diamond using French lace. I'm going to show you how to do that in just a minute. The interesting thing is it's filled with a square, well, a diamond shape that started out as a square that has rickrack and tatting and rickrack and French lace and rickrack and tatting. It's the rickrack that acts as the joiner between that. Now, that might look a little complicated to you but it is so easy. First of all let's do a lace shaped diamond. When I start with a lace shaped diamond I leave and you these lace shaping boards are wonderful if you don't have one of these though you can just use a cardboard box. All right I'm going to leave a tail of the lace uh, just leave a little tail exposed before you come around. Okay pin on the outside 
pin on the inside. I do love this board because the pins go in so easily. Fold the lace back on itself. Lay it right back on itself. Fold it, remove the pin that is on the inside. And voila, a perfect miter is folded in. All right, I'm gonna come up to the next point. I'm gonna put a pin at the top. I'm gonna put a pin at the bottom. And I did, since this is linen, actually the diamond is drawn underneath here. And if you have a fabric you can see through, you don't have to draw anything, but this is a linen fabric. So I did need to draw a pin at the top, pin at the bottom, fold it down, remove the pin that goes through two areas, come on around here. Don't worry about that little tab that's sticking out because later on after it's all stitched down, you're just gonna cut that away. Pin on the outside pin on the inside. Now what do we do? You got it. Fold it back on itself just like we did before. Remove the pin that goes through two layers and fold it on around and a perfect miter so far has been done. There's a little trick to the bottom miter. Pin at the top and twist it underneath itself. All right, pin at the top, twist it underneath itself, chop it off. You do have to remove it from the board after you spray starch it and press it. And the way you do that is when you spray starch and press and it gets completely dry, you can um, just hold it, lift it up, and pin it flat. You do not want to sew through your cardboard box today or through your board today. When it is finished, it looks like this. I'm going to first of all sew the outside, then I'm going to trim away the inside after zigzagging or wing needle entre dough wing or what stitch you want to do. The outside, trim away the fabric from the inside because we're going to fill it with something wonderful. Now when you're going to use rickrack to go as the bridging in between lace and tatting as we've used here, you've got to use a water soluble stabilizer to sew on and you have to use a little glue stick you do have to stabilize it so just a few little dots you'll draw your line first and then just a few little dots of the washable glue all the way down and then you will do a little more of the washable glue. I'm not really holding this because I don't have much time to show you. A little dab of the washable glue. And you've got to get it glued together and actually do your stitching on your water soluble stabilizer. That's very critical because this would slip and slide. And when you and then you just zigzag. And you think, well, do I zigzag? Will I catch every point? Well, you'll catch a little more than every point, but that's what you do. You just zigzag it down. Then of course wash away your water soluble stabilizer. Here's what it looks like after you've zigzagged. It, you will wash that away and press it. Isn't that a pretty piece? Then, you remember we made the diamond, we cut out the center section, so what we will do next is take that a beautiful piece, that center piece right there. Isn't that pretty? And then use stabilizer if you need to, but whatever stitch you're going to use, and then go to your sewing machine, zigzag or, or entre dough, whatever you're going to do there to attach it, and then go back and trim away the excess. And that's how easy it is to put that wonderful centerpiece inside the diamond. And now I have a piece from my vintage collection to share with you. This blouse is one of the most unusual in my collection. I believe it was around 1900. As a matter of fact, I'm almost sure, but you can see because of the scoop neck, that isn't a 1900 look. So I believe originally it had the high neck, like most of the blouses do, and then later it was made to be a little bit more modern for somebody who did a little bit of converting on it. The shoulder seams are beautiful because it isn't a real shoulder seam traditionally at all, but a piece of double needle pin tucks that has been inserted. The sleeves are completely fabulous. You know, we've just done the mitered diamond with the mitering technique. See, here's a miter. Here is another miter. Let's go on down on the sleeves. You can see more miters, more miters. And then insertion. You know, Sue Houseman did that beautiful uh, insertion in the hoop. Well, these were done on machines too, but they were done in Switzerland long before the 1900s were, were, came around. The blouse front details is, are just beautiful. It has a lot of the Swiss insertion, some pretty edgings that have been mitered, French edgings and the released pin tucks. It's absolutely beautiful. The back is equally as pretty as the front. You can just see that. Look at the double needle pin tucks, except they weren't double needle pin tucks. They were just regular pin tucks. And then we had the buttons. It's very unusual for me to find a blouse that has all but one of its original buttons. Thank you so much for joining me in my sewing room today. I've had a good time, and I certainly hope you have. I'd like to invite you to come back next time.